Section 31 of Europe Revised. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Europe Revised by Irvin S. Cobb. Chapter 15. Symptoms of the Disease, Part 1. The majority of these all-night places in Paris are singularly and monotonously alike. In the early hours of the evening the musicians rest from their labors, the regular habitués lay aside their air of professional abandon, with true French frugality the lights burn dim and low. But anon sounds the signal from the front of the house, strike up the band, here comes a sucker. Somebody resembling ready money has arrived. The lights flash on, the can-canners take the floor, the garçons flit hither and yon, and all is excitement. Enter the opulent American gentleman. Half a dozen functionaries greet him rapturously, bowing before his triumphant progress. Others relieve him of his hat and coat, so that he cannot escape prematurely. A whole reception committee escorts him to a place of honor facing the dancing area. The natives of the quarter stand in rows in the background, drinking beer or nothing at all, but the distinguished stranger sits at a front table and is served with champagne, and champagne only. It is inferior champagne, but because it is labeled American Brute, whatever that may denote, and because there is a poster on the bottle showing the American flag in the correct colors, he pays several times its proper value for it. From far corners and remote recesses, Corfis and court jesters swim forth to fawn on him, bask in his presence, glory in his smile, and sell him something. The whole thing is as mercenary as passing the hat. Cigarette girls, flower girls, and bonbon girls, postcard vendors, and confetti dispensers surround him impenetrably, taking him front, rear, by the right flank and the left, and they shove their wares in his face and will not take no for an answer, but they will take anything else. Two years ago, at a hunting camp in North Carolina, I thought I had met the creature with the most acute sense of hearing of any living thing. I refer to Pearl, the mare. Pearl was an elderly mare, white in color, and therefore known as Pearl. She was most gentle and kind. She was a reliable family animal, too, had a colt every year, but in her affiliation she was a pronounced reactionary. She went through life listening for somebody to say woe. Her ears were permanently slanted backward on that very account. She belonged to the Woe Lodge, which has a large membership among humans. Riding behind Pearl, you uttered the talismanic word in the thinnest thread of a whisper, and instantly she stopped. You could spell Woe on your fingers, and she would stop. You could take a pencil and a piece of paper out of your pocket and write down Woe, and she would stop. But compared with a sample assortment of these cabaret satellites, Pearl would have seemed as deaf as a post. Clear across a hundred-foot dance-hall they catch the sound of a restless dollar turning over in the fob-pocket of an American tourist. And they come a-running, and get it. Under the circumstances it requires self-hypnotism of a high order, and plenty of it, to make an American think he is enjoying himself. Still, he frequently attains to that happy consummation. To begin with, is he not in gay Paris? as it is familiarly called in Rome center and all points west? He is. Has he not kicked over the traces and cut loose with intent to be oh so naughty for one naughty night of his life? Such are the facts. Finally, and herein lies the proof conclusive, he is spending a good deal of money and is getting very little in return for it. Well, then, what better evidence is required? Any time he is paying four or five prices for what he buys and does not particularly need it, or want it after it is bought, the average American can delude himself into the belief that he is having a brilliant evening. This is a racial trait worthy of the scientific consideration of Professor Hugo Munsterberg and other students of our national psychology. So far the Munsterberg school has overlooked it, but the canny Parisians have not. They long ago studied out every quirk and wriggle of it, and capitalized it to their own purpose. Liberty, economy, frugality. There they are, everywhere blazoned forth. Liberty for you, economy and frugality for them. Could anything on earth be fairer than that? Even so, the rapturous reception accorded to a North American pales to a dim and flickery puniness alongside the perfect riot and whirlwind of enthusiasm 
which marks the entry into an all-night place of a South American. Time was when, to the French understanding, exuberant prodigality in the United States were termed synonymous. That time has passed. Of recent years our young kinsmen from the sister republics nearer the equator and the horn have invaded Paris in numbers, bringing their impulsive temperaments and their bankrolls with them. Thanks to these young cattle kings, those callow silver princes from Argentina and Brazil, from Peru and from Ecuador, a new and more gorgeous standard for money-wasting has been established. You had thought, perchance, there was no rite and ceremonial quite so impressive as a head-waiter in a Fifth Avenue restaurant, squeezing the blood out of a semi-raw canvasback in a silver duck press for a free spender from Butte or Pittsburgh. I, too, had thought that. But wait, just wait, until you have seen a maitre d'hôtel on the Avenue de l'Opéra, with the smile of the canary-fed cat on his face, standing just behind a hide and tallow baron or a guano duke from somewhere in far spiggity land watching this person as he wades into the fresh fruit checking off on his fingers each blushing south african peach at two francs the bite and each purple cluster of hothouse grapes at one franc the grape that spectacle believe me is worth the money every time there is just one being whom the dwellers of the all-night quarter love and revere more deeply than they love a downy, squabbling scion of some rich South American family, and that is a large, broad negro pugilist with a mouthful of gold teeth and a shirt-front full of yellow diamonds. To an American, and especially to an American who was reared below Mason and Dixon's justly popular line, it is indeed edifying to behold a black heavyweight fourth raider from South Clark Street, Chicago, taking his ease in a smart café, entirely surrounded by worshipful boulevardiers, both male and female. Now, as I remarked at an earlier stage of these observations, there is another Paris besides this, a Paris of history, of art, of architecture, of literature, of refinement, a Paris inhabited by a people with a pride in their past, a pluck in their present, and a faith in their future, a Paris of kindly aristocrats, of thrifty, pious, plain people, a Paris of students and savants and scientists, of great actors and great scientists and great dramatists. There is one Paris that might well be burned to its unclean roots, and another Paris that will be glorified in the minds of mankind forever. And it would be unfair to say that the Paris which comes flaunting its tinsel of voice and pinchbeck villainy in the casual tourist's face is the real Paris as it would be for a man from the interior of the United States to visit New York, and after interviewing one Bowery bouncer, one tenderloin cabman, and one Broadway ticket speculator, to go back home and say he had met fit representatives of the predominant classes of New York society, and had found them unfit. Yes, it would be even more unfair, for the alleged gay life of New York touches at some point of contact or other the lives of most New Yorkers, whereas in Paris there are numbers of sane and decent folks who seem to know nothing except by hearsay of what goes on after dark in the Montmartre district. Besides, no man in the course of a short and crowded stay may hope to get under the skin of any community, great or small. He merely skims its surface cuticle. He sees no deeper than the pores and the hair roots. The arteries, the frame, the real tissue structure remain hidden to him. Therefore the pity seems all the greater that, to the world at large, the bad Paris should mean all Paris. It is that other and more wholesome Paris which one sees, a light-hearted, good-natured, polite, and courteous Paris, when one, biding his time and choosing the proper hour and proper place, goes abroad to seek it out. For the stranger who does at least a part of his sightseeing after a rational and orderly fashion, there are pictures that will live in the memory always. The Madeline, with the flower market just alongside, the green and gold woods of the Bois de Boulogne, the grandstand of the racecourse at Longchamp on a fair afternoon in the autumn, the opera at night, the promenade of the Champs-Élysées on a Sunday morning after church, the gardens of the Tuileries, the wonderful circling plaza of the Place Vendôme, where one may spend a happy hour if the maniacal taxi-drivers deign to spare one's life for so unaccountably long a period, the arcades of the Rue de Rivoli, with their exquisite shops, 
where every other shop is a jeweler's shop, and every jeweler's shop is just like every other jeweler's shop, which fact ceases to cause wonder when one learns that, with a few notable exceptions, all these shops carry their wares on commission from the stocks of the same manufacturing jewellers. The old Ile de la Cité, with the second-hand bookstalls stretching along the quay, and the Seine placidly meandering between its man-made, man-ruled banks. Days spent here seem short days, but that may be due in some part to the difference between our time and theirs. In Paris, you know, the day ends five or six hours earlier than it does in America. The two palaces of fine arts are fine enough, and finer still, on beyond them, is the great Pont Alexandre III. But to my untutored instincts, all three of these, with their clumpings of flag standards and their grouping of marble allegories, which are so aching white to the eye in sunlight, seem overly suggestive of a world's fair as we know such things in America. Seeing them, I knew where the architects who designed the main approaches and the courts of honor for all our big expositions got their notions for color schemes and statuary effects. I liked better those two ancient triumphal arches of Saint-Martin and Saint-Denis on the boulevard Saint-Denis, and much better even than these the tremendous sweep of the Place de la Concorde, which is one of the finest squares in the world, and the one with the grimmest, bloodiest history, I reckon. The Paris to which all these things properly appertain is at its very best and brightest on a Sunday Sunday afternoon in the parks, where well-to-do people drive or ride, and their children play among the trees under the eyes of nursemaids in the quaint costumes of Normandy, though for all I know it may be Picardy. Elsewhere in these parks the not-so-well-to-do gather in great numbers, some drinking harmless syrupy drinks at the gay little refreshment kiosks some packing themselves about the man who has tamed the tree-sparrows until they come at his call, and hive in chattering, fluttering swarms on his head and his arms and shoulders, some applauding a favorite game of the middle classes that is being played in every wide and open space. I do not know its name, could not find anybody who seemed to know its name, but this game is a kind of glorified battledore and shuttlecock played with a small, hard ball, capable of being driven high and far by smartly administered strokes of a hide-headed, rim device shaped like a tambourine. It would seem also to be requisite to its proper playing that each player shall have a red coat and a full spade beard, and a tremendous amount of speed and skill. If the ball gets lost in anybody's whiskers, I think it counts ten for the opposing side, but I do not know the other rules." A certain indefinable, unmistakably Gallic flavor or piquancy savors the life of the people. It disappears only when they cease to be their own natural selves. A woman novelist, American by birth, but a resident of several years in Paris, told me a story illustrative of this. The incident she narrowed was so typical that it could never have happened except in Paris, I thought. She said she was one of a party who went one night to dine at a little café much frequented by artists and art students. The host was himself an artist of reputation. As they dined there entered a tall, gloomy figure of a man with a long, ugly face full of flexible wrinkles, such a figure and such a face as instantly commanded their attention. This man slid into a seat at a table near their table and had a frugal meal. He had reached the stage of demi tasse and cigarette when he laid down cup and cigarette, and fetching a bit of cardboard and a crayon out of his pocket, began putting down lines and shadings. Between strokes he covertly studied the profile of the man who was giving the dinner party. Not to be outdone, the artist hauled out his drawing pad and pencil and made a quick sketch of the long-faced man. Both finished their jobs practically at the same moment, and rising together with low bows, they exchanged pictures. Each had done a rattlingly good character of the other, and then, without a word having been spoken or a move made towards striking up an acquaintance, each man sat him down again and finished his dinner. End of section 31For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Europe Revised by Irvin S. Cobb. Chapter 15. Symptoms of the Disease, Part 2. 
The lone diner departed first. When the party at the other table had had their coffee, they went round the corner to a little circus, one of the common type of French circuses which are housed in permanent wooden buildings instead of under tents. Just as they entered, the premier clown, in spangles and peak cap, bounded into the ring. Through the coating of powder on it they recognized his wrinkly, mobile face. It was the sketch-making stranger whose handiwork they had admired not half an hour before. Hearing the tale, we went to the same circus and saw the same clown. His ears were painted bright red, the red ear is the inevitable badge of the French clown, and he had as a foil for his funning a comic countryman known in the program as Auguste, which is the customary name of all comic countrymen in France, and though I knew only at second hand of his sketch-making abilities, I am willing to concede that he was the drollest master of pantomime I ever saw. On leaving the circus, very naturally, we went to the café, where the first part of the little dinner comedy had been enacted. We encountered both artists, professional or amateur, of black lead and Bristol board, but we met a waiter there who was an artist in his line. I ordered a cigar of him, specifying that the cigar should be of a brand made in Havana and popular in the States. He brought one cigar on a tray. In size and shape, in general aspect, it seemed to answer the required specifications. The little belly band about its dark brown abdomen was certainly orthodox and regular, but no sooner had I lit it and taken a couple of puffs than I was seized with the conviction that something had crawled up that cigar and died. So I examined it more closely, and I saw then that it was a bad French cigar, artfully adorned about its middle with a second-hand band which the waiter had picked up after somebody else had plucked it off one of the genuine articles and had treasured, no doubt, against the coming of some unsophisticated patron such as I. And I doubt whether that could have happened anywhere except in Paris either. That is just it, you see. Try as hard as you please to see the real Paris, the Paris of petty larceny and small mean graft intrudes on you and takes a peck at your purse. Go where you will, you cannot escape it. You journey, let us assume, to the tomb of Napoleon, under the great dome that rises behind the wide-armed Hôtel des Invalides. From a splendid rotunda you look down to where, craftily touched by the softened light streaming in from high above, that great sarcophagus stands housing the bones of Bonaparte, and above the entrance to the crypt you read the words from the last will and testament of him who sleeps here. I desire that my ashes may repose on the banks of the Seine, among the French people I have so well loved. And you reflect that he so well loved them that, to glut his lusting after power and yet more power, he led sundry hundreds of thousand of them to massacre and mutilation and starvation. But that is the way of the world, conquerors the world over, and has absolutely nothing to do with this tale. The point I am trying to get at is, if you can gaze unmoved at this sepulchre you are a clod and if you can get away from its vicinity without being held up and gouged by small grafters, you are a wonder. Not tombs nor temples nor sanctuaries are safe from the profane and polluting feet of the buzzing plague of them. You journey miles away from this spot to the great cemetery of Père Lachaise. You trudge past seemingly unending, constantly unfolding miles of monuments and mausoleums, you view the storied urns and animated busts that mark the final resting places of France's illustrious dead. And as you marvel that France should have had so many illustrious dead, and that so many of them at this writing should be so dead, out from behind de Musset's vault or Marshal Ney's comes a snoopy, smirking wretch to pester you to the desperation that is red-eyed and homicidal with his picture postcards and his execrable wooden carvings. You fight the persistent vermin off, and flee for refuge to that shrine of every American who knows his Mark Twain. The joint grave, footnote, being French, and therefore economical, those two are, as it were, splitting one tomb between them, of Hell Loisy and Abbey Lard, footnote, popular tourist pronunciation, and lo, in the very shadow of it there lurks a blood brother to the first pest. I defy you to get out of that cemetery without buying something of no value from one or the other, or both of them. The communists made their last stand in Père Lachaise. So did I. They went down fighting. Same here. They were licked to a frazzle. Ditto, ditto. Next, we will say, Notre Dame draws you. Within you walk the clattering flags of its dim long aisles, 
Without, you peer aloft to view its gargoyled water-spouts, leering down like nightmares caught in the very act of leering and congealing into stone. The spirit of the place possesses you. You conger up a vision of the little maid Esmeralda and the squat hunchback who dwelt in the tower above, and, at the precise moment, a foul vagabond pounces on you, with a wink that is in itself an insult, and a smile that should earn for him a kick for every inch of its breadth, he draws from beneath his coat a set of nasty photographs, things which no decent man could look at without gagging, and would not carry about with him on his person for a million dollars in cash. By threats and hard words you drive him off, but seeing others of his kind drawing nigh you run away, with no particular destination in mind except to discover some spot, however obscure and remote, where the wicked cease from troubling and the weary may be at rest for a few minutes. You cross a bridge to the farther bank of the river, and presently you find yourself, at least I found myself there, in one of the very few remaining quarters of old Paris, as yet untouched by the scheme of improvement, that is wiping out whatever is medieval and therefore unsanitary, and making it all over, modern and slick and shiny. Losing yourself, and with yourself, your sense of the reality of things, you wander into a maze of tall, beetle-browed old houses with tiny windows that lower at you from under their dormered lids like hostile eyes. Above, on the attic ledges, are boxes of flowers and coops where caged larks and linnets pipe cheery snatches of song, and on beyond, between the eaves, which bend toward one another like gossips who would swap whispered confidences, is a strip of sky. Below are smells of age and dampness and there is a rich, nutritious, garlicky smell, too, and against a jog in the wall a frowsy but picturesque rag-picker is asleep on a pile of sacks, with a big sleek cat asleep on his breast. I do not guarantee the rag-picker. He and his cat may have moved since I was there and saw them, although they had the look about them both of being permanent fixtures. You pass a little church, lolling and lopped with the weight of the years, and through its doors you catch a vista of old pillars and soft half-lights, and twinkling candles set upon the high altar. Not even the gym crackery with which the Latin races dress up their holy places and the graves of their dead can entirely dispel its abiding, brooding air of peace and majesty. You linger a moment outside just such a tavern as a certain ragged poet of parts might have frequented the while he penned his versified inquiry, which after all these centuries is not yet satisfactorily answered, touching on the approximate whereabouts of the snows that fell yester-year and the roses that bloomed yester-week. Midway of a winding alley you come to an ancient wall with an ancient gate, crowned with the half-effaced quarterings of an ancient house, and you halt, almost expecting that the rusted hinges will creak a warning, and the wooden halves begrudgingly divide and that from under the slewed arch will issue a most gallant swashbuckler with his buckles all buckled, and his swash swashing, hence the name. At this juncture you feel a touch on your shoulder. You spin on your heel, feeling at your hip for an imaginary sword. But tis not Master Francois Villon, in tattered doublet, with a sonnet, nor yet is it a jaunty blade, in silken cloak, with a challenge. It is your friend of the obscene photograph collection. He has followed you all the way from 1914 clear back into the Middle Ages, biding his time and hoping you will change your mind about investing in his nasty wares. With your wife or your sister you visit the Louvre. You look on the winged victory and admire her classic but somewhat bulky proportions, meantime saying to yourself that it certainly must have been a mighty hard battle the lady won, because she lost her head and both arms in doing it. You tire of interminable portraits of the Grand Monarch, showing him grouped with his wife, the old-fashioned square upright, and his son, the baby Grand, and his prime minister, the lyre, and his brother, the yellow clarinet, and the rest of the orchestra. You examine the space on the wall where Mona Lisa is or is not smiling her inscrutable smile, depending on whether the open season for Mona Lisa's has come or passed. Wandering your weary way past the works of Rubens, and miles of Titians, and townships of Carats, and ranges of Michelangelo's, and quarter sections of Raphael's, and government reserves of Leonardo da Vinci's, you stray off finally into a side passage to see something else, 
leaving your wife or your sister behind in one of the main galleries. You are gone only a minute or two, but returning you find her furiously, helplessly angry and embarrassed, and on inquiry you learn she has been enduring the ordeal of being ogled by a small, wormy-looking creature who has gone without shaving for two or three years in a desperate endeavor to resemble a real man. Some day somebody will take a squirt gun and a pint of insect powder and destroy these little hairy caterpillars who infest all parts of Paris and make it impossible for a respectable woman to venture on the streets unaccompanied. Let us, for the further adornment and final elaboration of the illustration, say that you are sitting at one of the small round tables which make mushroom beds under the awnings along the boulevards. All about you are French people, enjoying themselves in an easy and rational and an inexpensive manner. As for yourself, all you desire is a quiet half-hour in which to read your paper, sip your coffee, and watch the shifting panorama of street life. That, emphatically, is all you ask, merely that and a little privacy. Are you permitted to have it? You are not. Beggars beseech you to look on their afflictions. Sidewalk vendors cluster about you, and if you are smoking the spark of your cigar inevitably draws a full delegation of those moldy old whisker who follow the profession of collecting butts and quids. They hover about you, watchful as chicken hawks, and their bleary eyes envy you for each puff you take, until you grow uneasy and self-reproachful under their glare, and your smoke is spoiled for you. Very few men smoke well before an audience, even an audience of their own selection. So before your cigar is half finished, you toss it away, and while it is yet in the air, the watchers leap forward and squabble under your feet for the prize. Then the winner emerges from the scramble and departs along the sidewalk to seek his next victim, with the still-smoking trophy impaled on his steel-pointed tool of trade. In desperation you rise up from there and flee away to your hotel and hide in your room, and lock and double-lock the doors, and begin to study timetables with a view to quitting Paris on the first train leaving for anywhere, the only drawback to a speedy consummation of this happy prospect being that no living creature can fathom the meaning of French timetables. It is not so much the aggregate amount of which they have despoiled you, it is the knowledge that every other person in Paris is seeking and planning to nick you for some sum, great or small. It is the realization, by reason of your ignorance of the language and the customs of the land, you are at their mercy, and they have no mercy, that, as Walter Potter so succinctly phrases it, that is what gets your goat, and gets it good. So you shake the dust from your feet, your own dust, not Paris's dust, and you depart per hired back for the station and per train from the station. And as the train draws away from the train shed, you behold behind you two legends or inscriptions, repeated and reiterated everywhere on the walls of the French capital. One of them says, English spoken here, and the other says, Liberty, economy, frugality. End of section 32. Section 33 of Europe Revised. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Europe Revised by Irvin S. Cobb. Chapter 16. As Done in London, Part One. London is essentially a he-town, just as Paris is indubitably a she-town. That untranslatable, unmistakable something which is not to be defined in the plain terms of speech, yet which sets its mark on any long-settled community, has branded them both, the one as being masculine, the other as being feminine. For Paris the lily stands, the conventionalized, feminized lily, but London is a lion, a shag-headed, heavy-pawed British lion. One thinks of Paris as a woman, rather pretty, somewhat regardless of morals and decidedly slovenly a person, craving admiration, but too indolent to earn it by keeping herself presentable, covering up the dirt on a piquant face with rice powder, wearing paste jewels in her earlobes in an effort to distract criticism from the fact that the ears themselves stand in need of soap and water. London, viewed in retrospect, seems a great, clumsy, slow-moving giant, with hair on his chest and soil under his nails, confident in the larger affairs and careless about the smaller ones, amply satisfied with himself and disdainful of the opinions of outsiders, 
having all of a man's vices, and a good share of his virtues, loving sport for sport's sake, and power for its own sake, and despising art for art's sake. You do not have to spend a week, or a month, or a year, in either Paris or London, to note these things. The distinction is wide enough to be seen in a day, yes, or in an hour. It shows in all the outer aspects. An overtowering majority of the smart shops in Paris cater to women. A large majority of the smart shops in London cater to men. It shows in their voices, for cities have voices just as individuals have voices. New York is not yet old enough to have found its own sex. It belongs still to the neuter gender. New York is not even a noun. It's a verb transitive, but its voice is a female voice, just as Paris's voice is. New York, like Paris, is full of strident, shrieking sounds, shrill outcries, hysterical babblings, a woman's bridge whist club at the hour of casting up the score. But London now is different. London, at all hours, speaks with a sustained, sullen, steady, grinding tone, never entirely sinking into quietude, never rising to acute discords. The sound of London rolls on like a river, a river that ebbs sometimes, but rarely floods above its normal banks. It impresses one as the necessary breathing of a grunting and burdened monster who has a mighty job on his hands and is taking his own good time about doing it. In London, mind you, the newsboys do not shout their extras. They bear in their hands placards with black-typed announcements of the big news stories of the day, and even these headings seem designed to soothe rather than to excite, saying, for example, such things as special from liner, in referring to a disaster at sea, and meeting in Ulster, when meaning that the northern part of Ireland has gone on record as favoring civil war before home rule. The street vendors do not bray on noisy trumpets or ring with bells or utter loud cries to advertise their wares. The policeman does not shout his orders out. He holds aloft the striped sleeve arm of authority, and all London obeys. I think the reason why the Londoners turned so viciously on the suffragettes was not because of the things the suffragettes clamored for, but because they clamored for them so loudly. They jarred the public peace. That must have been it. I can understand why an adult American might go to Paris and stay in Paris and be satisfied with Paris, if he were a lover of art and millinery in all their branches, or why he might go to Berlin if he were studying music and municipal control, or to Amsterdam if he cared for cleanliness and new cheese, or to Vienna if he were concerned with surgery, light opera, and the effect on the human lungs of doing without fresh air for long periods of time, or to Rome if he were an antiquarian and interested in ancient life, or to Naples if he were an entomologist and interested in insect life, or to Venice if he liked ruins with water round them, or to Padua if he liked ruins with no water anywhere near them. No, I'm blessed if I can think of a single good reason why a sane man should go to Padua if he could go anywhere else. But I think I know good and well why a man might spend his whole vacation in London and enjoy every minute of it. For this old fogey, old foggy town of London is a man-sized town, and man-run town, and it has a fascination of its own that is as much a part of it as London's grime is, or London's vastness, and London's pettiness, or London's wealth, and its stark poverty, or its atrocious suburbs, or its dirty, trade-fretted river, or its dismal back streets, or its still more dismal slums, or anything that is London's. To a man hailing from a land where everything is so new that quite a good deal of it has not even happened yet, it is a joyful thing to turn off a main-traveled road into one of the crooked byways in which the older parts of London abound, and suddenly to come, full face, on a house, or a court, or a pump, which figured in epical history or epical literature of the English-speaking race. It is a still greater joy to find it, house, or court, or pump, or what not, looking now pretty much as it must have looked when good Queen Bess, or little Dick Whittington, or Chaucer the Scribe, or Shakespeare the player came this way. It is fine to be riding through the country and pass a peaceful green meadow and inquire its name of your driver and be told, most off-handedly, that it is a place called Runnymede. Each time this happened to me I felt the thrill of a discoverer, as though I had been the first traveler to find these spots. I remember that through an open door I was marveling at the domestic economies of an English barber-shop. 
I use the word economies in this connection advisedly, for compared with the average high-polished, sterilized, and antiseptic barber shop of an American city, this shop seemed a torture cave. In London, pubs are like that, and some dentist establishments and law offices, musty, fusty dens very unlike their Yankee counterparts. In this particular shop now, the chairs were hard, wooden chairs, the looking-glass, you could not rightly call it a mirror, was cracked and bleary, and an apprentice boy went from one patron to another, lathering each face, and then the master followed after him, razor in hand, and shaved the waiting countenances in turn. Flies that looked as though they properly belonged in a livery stable were buzzing about, and there was a prevalent odor which made me think that all the sick pomade in the world had come hither to spend its last declining hours. I said to myself that this place would bear further study, that some day, when I felt particularly hardy and daring, I would come here and be shaved, and afterward would write a piece about it and sell it for money. So the better to fix its location in my mind, I glanced up at the street sign, and behold, I was hard by Drury Lane, where sweet Nellie once, upon a time, held her court. Another time I stopped in front of a fruiterer's, my eye having been caught by the presence in his window of half a dozen draggled-looking, wilted roasting ears decorated with a placard reading as follows, American maize or Indian corn, a vegetable, to be boiled and then eaten. I was remarking to myself that these Britishers were surely a strange race of beings, that if England produced so delectable a thing as green corn, we in America would import it by the shipload and serve it on every table whereas here it was so rare that they needs must label it as belonging to the vegetable kingdom, lest people should think it might be an animal, when I chanced to look more closely at the building occupied by the fruiterer and saw that it was an ancient house, half-timbered above the first floor, with a queer low-browed roof. Inquiring afterward I learned that this house dated straight back to Elizabethan days, and still on beyond for so many years that no man knew exactly how many and I began to understand in a dim sort of way how and why it was that these people held so fast to the things they had, and cared so little for the things they had not. Better than by all the reading you have ever done, you absorb a sense and realization of the splendor of England's past, when you go to Westminster Abbey and stand, figuratively, with one foot on Johnson and another on Dryden, and if, overcome by the presence of so much dead and gone greatness, you fall in a fit, you commit a trespass on the last resting pace of Macaulay or Clive, or somebody of equal consequence. More imposing even than Westminster is St. Paul's. I am not thinking so much of the memorials, or the tombs, or the statues there, but of the tattered battle-flags bearing the names of battles fought by the English in every crack and cranny of the world, from Quebec to Ladysmith, from Lucknow to Khartoum. Beholding them there, draped above the tombs, some faded but still intact, some mere clotted wisps of ragged silk clinging to blackened standards, gives one an uplifting conception of the spirit that has sent the British soldier forth to girth the globe, never faltering, never slackening pace, never giving back a step to-day, but that he took two steps forward to-morrow, never stopping except for tea. The fool has said in his heart that he would go to England and come away and write something about his impressions but never write a single solitary word about the Englishman's tea-drinking habit, or the Englishman's cricket-paying habit, or the Englishman's lack of a sense of humor. I was that fool. But it cannot be done. Lacking these things, England would not be England. It would be Hamlet without Hamlet, or the ghost, or the wicked queen, or mad Ophelia, or her tiresome old pa. For most English life and the bulk of English conversation center about sporting topics, with the topic of cricket predominating. And, at a given hour of the day the wheels of the empire stop, and everybody in the empire, from the king in the counting-house counting up his money, to the maid in the garden hanging out the clothes, drops what he or she may be doing and imbibes tea until further orders. And what oceans of tea they do imbibe! There was an old lady who sat near us in a tea-shop one afternoon. 
As well as might be judged by one who saw her in a sitting posture only, she was no deeper than any other old lady of average dimensions. But in rapid succession she tilted five large cups of piping hot tea into herself, and was starting on the sixth when we withdrew, stunned by the spectacle. She must have been fearfully long-wasted. I had a mental vision of her interior decorations, all fumed oak wainscoting and buff leather hangings. Still, I doubt whether their four o'clock tea habit is any worse than our five o'clock cocktail habit. It all depends, I suppose, on whether one prefers being tanned inside to being pickled. But we are getting bravely over our cocktail habit, as attested by figures in the visual evidence, while their tea habit is growing on them, so the statisticians say. As for the Englishman's sense of humor, or his lack of it, I judge that we Americans are partly wrong in our diagnosis of that phase of British character, and partly right. Because he is slow to laugh at a joke, we think he cannot see the point of it without a diagram and a chart. What we do not take into consideration is that, through centuries of self-repression, the Englishman has so drilled himself into refraining from laughing in public, for fear, you see, of making himself conspicuous, it has become a part of his nature. Indeed, in certain quarters a prejudice against laughing under any circumstances appears to have sprung up. End of section 33thirty four of Europe revised. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Europe revised by Irvin S. Cobb. Chapter sixteen. As done in London. Part two. I was looking one day through the pages of one of the critical English weeklies. Nearly all British weeklies are heavy, and this is the heaviest of the lot. Its editorial column alone weighs from twelve to eighteen pounds, and if you strike a man with a clubbed copy of it, the crime is assault with a dull blunt instrument, with intent to kill. At the end of a preponderous review of the East India question, I came on a letter written to the editor by a gentleman signing himself with his own name, and reading in part as follows. Sir, Laughter is always vulgar and offensive. For instance, whatever there may be of pleasure in a theatre, and there is not much, the place is made impossible by laughter. No, it is very seldom that happiness is refined or pleasant to see. Merriment that is produced by wine is false merriment, and there is no true merriment without it. Laughter is profane, in fact, where it is not ridiculous." On the other hand, the English in bulk will laugh at a thing which among us would bring tears to the most hardened cheek and incite our rebellious souls to mayhem and manslaughter. On a certain night we attended a musical show at one of the biggest London theatres. There was some really clever funning by a straight comedian, but his best efforts died a borning. They drew but the merest ripple of laughter from the audience. Later there was a scene between a sad person made up as a Scotchman and another equally sad person of color from the States. These times no English musical show is complete unless the cast includes a North American negro, with his lips painted to resemble a wide slice of ripe watermelon, singing ragtime ditties touching on his chicken and his baby doll. This pair took the stage, all others considerately withdrawing, and, presently, after a period of heart-rending comicalities, the Scotchman, speaking as though he had a mouthful of hot oatmeal, proceeded to narrate an account of a fictitious encounter with a bear. Substantially, this dialogue ensued. The Scotchman. He was a vera fierce grizzly bear, ye can, and he rushed at me from behind a jagged rock. The Negro. Mister, you means a jagged rock, don't you? The Scotchman. Nay, nay, laddie, a jugged rock. The Negro. What's that you say? What? What is a jugged rock? The Scotchman, forgetting his accent. Why, a rock with a jug on it, old chap. A stage weight to let that soak into them all in its full strength. A rock with a jug on it would be a jugged rock, wouldn't it, eh? The pause had been sufficient. They had it now. And from all parts of the house a whoop of unrestrained joy went up. Witnessing such spectacles as this, the American observer naturally begins to think that the English in mass cannot see a joke that is the least bit subtle. Nevertheless, however, and to the contrary notwithstanding, 
as Colonel Bill Sterrett of Texas used to say, England has produced the greatest natural humorists in the world and some of the greatest comedians, and for a great many years has supported the greatest comic paper printed in the English language, and that is Punch. Also, at an informal Saturday night dinner in a well-known London club, I heard as much spontaneous repartee from the company at large, and as much quiet humor from the chairman, as I ever heard in one evening anywhere. But if you went into that club on a weekday, you might suppose somebody was dead and laid out there, and that everybody about the premises had gone into deep mourning for the deceased. If any member of that club had dared then to crack a joke, they would have expelled him, as soon as they got over the shock of the bounder's confounded cheek. Saturday night? Yes. Monday afternoon? Never. And there you are. Speaking of Punch reminds me that we were in London when Punch, after giving the matter due consideration for a period of years, came out with a colored jacket on him. If the Prime Minister had done a Highland fling in costume at high noon in Oxford Circus, it would not have created more excitement than Punch created by coming out with a colored cover. Yet to an American's understanding the change was not so revolutionary and radical as all that. Punch's well-known liniments remained the same. There was merely a dab of palish yellow here and there on the sheet. At first glance you might have supposed somebody else had been reading your copy of Punch at breakfast, and had been careless in spooning up his soft-boiled egg. They are our cousins, the English are, our cousins once removed, tis true. See standard histories of the American Revolution for further details of the removing. But they are kinsmen of ours, beyond a doubt. Even if there were no other evidence, the kinship between us would still be proved by the fact that the English are the only people except the Americans who look on red meat, beef, mutton, ham, as a food to be eaten for the taste of the meat itself, whereas the other nations of the earth regard it as a vehicle for carrying various sauces, dressings, and stuffings southward to the stomach. But to the notice of the American who is paying them his first visit, they certainly do offer some amazing contradictions. In the large matters of business the English have been accused of trickiness, which, however, may be but the voice of envious competition speaking, but in the small things they surely are most marvellously honest. Consider their railroad trains now. To a greenhorn from this side of the blue water, a railroad journey out of London to almost any point in rural England is a succession of surprises, and all pleasant ones. To begin with, apparently there is nobody at the station whose business it is to show you your train, or to examine your ticket before you have found your train for yourself. There is no mad scurrying about at the moment of departure, no bleeding of directions through megaphones. Unchaperoned you move along a platform under a grimy shed, where trains are standing with their carriage doors hospitably ajar, and unassisted you find your own train and your own carriage and enter therein. Sharp on the minute an unseen hand, at least I never saw it, slams the doors and coyly, you might almost say secretively, the train moves out of the terminal. It moves smoothly and practically without jarring sounds. There is no shrieking of steel against steel. It is as though the rails were made of rubber and the wheel flanges were faced with noise-proof felt. No conductor comes to punch your ticket, no brakeman to bellow the stops, no train butcher bleeding the gabbled in voice of his gumdrops, bananas, and other best sellers. Glory be! It is all so peaceful and soothing, as peaceful and as soothing as the land through which you are gliding, when once you have left behind smoky London and its interminable environs. For now you are in a land that was finished and plenished five hundred years ago, and since then has not been altered in any material aspect whatsoever. Every blade of grass is in its right place. Every wayside shrub seemingly has been restrained and trained to grow in exactly the right and proper way. Streaming by your car window goes a tastefully arranged succession of the thatched cottages, the huddled little towns, the meandering brooks, the ancient inns, the fine old country places, the high-hedged estates of the landed gentry, with rose-covered lodges at the gates and robust children in the doorways, just as you have always seen them in the picture-books. There are fields that are velvet lawns, and lawns that are carpets of green-cut plush. 
England is the only country I know of that lives up, exactly and precisely, to its storybook descriptions and its storybook illustrations. Eventually you come to your stopping point, at least you have reason to believe it may be your stopping point. As well as you may judge by the signs that plaster the front, the sides, and even the top of the station, the place is either a beef extract or a washing compound. Nor may you count on any travellers who may be sharing your compartment with you to set you right by a timely word or two. Your fellow passengers may pity you for your ignorance and your perplexity, but they would not speak. They could not, not having been introduced. A German or a Frenchman would be giving you gladly what aid he might, but a well-born Englishman who had not been introduced would ride for nine years with you and not speak. I found the best way of solving the puzzle was to consult the time-card. If the time-card said our train would reach a given point at a given hour, and this was the given hour, then we might be pretty sure it was the given point. Time-tables in England are written by realists not by gifted fiction writers of the impressionistic school, as is frequently the case in America. So, if this time card says it is time for you to get off, you get off, with your ticket still in your possession, and if it be a small station, you go yourself and look up the station-master, who is tucked away in a secluded cubbyhole somewhere absorbing tea, or else is in the luggage-room fussing with baby carriages and patent churns. Having ferreted him out in his hiding-place, you hand over your ticket to him, and he touches his cap-brim and says, Q, very politely, which concludes the ceremony so far as you are concerned. Then, if you have brought any heavy baggage with you in the baggage-car, pardon, I meant the luggage-van, you go back to the platform and pick it out from the heap of luggage that has been dumped there by the train-hands. With ordinary luck and forethought, you could easily pick out and claim and carry off some other person's trunk provided you fancied it more than your own trunk, only you do not. You do not do this any more than, having purchased a second-class ticket or a third-class, you ride first-class, though, so far as I could tell, there is no check to prevent a person from so doing. At least an Englishman never does. It never seems to occur to him to do so. The English have no imagination. I have a suspicion that if one of our railroads tried to operate its train service on such a basis of confidence in the general public, there would be a most deceitful hiatus in the receipts from passenger traffic to be reported to a distressed group of stockholders at the end of the fiscal year. This, however, is merely a supposition on my part. I may be wrong. End of section 34《Of Europe Revised》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Europe Revised by Irvin S. Cobb, Chapter Seventeen, Britain in Twenty Minutes, Part One. To a greater degree, I take it, than any other race, the English have mastered the difficult art of minding their own affairs. The average Englishman is tremendously knowledgeable about his own concerns, and monumentally ignorant about all other things. If an Englishman's business requires that he shall learn the habits and customs of the Patagonians or the Chicagoans, or any other race which, because it is not British, he naturally regards as barbaric, he goes and learns them, and learns them well. Otherwise your Britisher does not bother himself with what the outlander may or may not do. An Englishman cannot understand an American's instinctive desire to know about things. We do not understand his lack of curiosity in that direction. Both of us forget what I think must be the underlying reasons. We are a race which, until comparatively recently, lived wide distances apart in sparsely settled lands, and were dependent on the passing stranger for news of the rest of the world, where he belongs to a people who all these centuries have been packed together in their little island, like oats in a bin. London itself is so crowded that the noses of most of the lower classes turn up. There is not room for them to point straight ahead without causing a great and bitter confusion of noses. But whether it points upward or outward or downward, the owner of the nose pretty generally refrains from ramming it into other folks' business. If he and all his fellows did not do this, if they had not learned to keep their voices down and to muffle unnecessary noises, if they had not built tight covers of reserve about themselves, as the oyster builds a shell to protect his tender tissues from irritation, they would long ago have become a race of nervous wrecks, instead of being what they are, 
the most stolid beings alive. In London even royalty is mercifully vouchsafed a reasonable amount of privacy from the intrusion of the gimlet eye and the chisel nose. Royalty may ride in a rotten row of a morning, promenade on the mall at noon, and shop in the Regent Street shops in the afternoon, and, at all times, go unguarded and unbothered, I had almost said unnoticed. It may be that long and constant familiarity with the institution of royalty has bred indifference in the London mind to the physical presence of dukes and princes and things, but I am inclined to think a good share of it should be attributed to the inborn and ingrown British faculty for letting other folks be. One morning, as I was walking at random through the aristocratic district, of which St. James is the solar plexus and Park Lane the spinal cord, I came to a big mansion where foot guards stood sentry at the wall gates. This house was further distinguished from its neighbors by the presence of a policeman pacing alongside it, and a newspaper photographer setting up his tripod and camera in the road, and a small knot of passers-by lingering in the opposite side of the way, as though waiting for somebody to come along or something to happen. I waited, too. In a minute a handsome old man and a well-set-up young man turned the corner afoot. The younger man was leading a beautiful stag-hound. The photographer touched his hat and said something, and the younger man, smiling a good-natured smile, obligingly posed in the street for a picture. At this precise moment a dirigible balloon came careening over the chimney-pots on a cross-London air-jaunt, and at the sight of it the little crowd left the young man and the photographer and set off at a run to follow, as far as they might, the course of the balloon. Now, in North America this could not have occurred, for the balloon man would not have been aloft at such an hour. He would have been on the earth. Moreover, he would have been outside the walls of that mansion-house, along with half a million more or less of his patriotic fellow-countrymen, tearing his own clothes off and their clothes off, trampling the weak and sickly underfoot, bucking the doubled and tripled police lines in a mad, vain effort to see the flagpole on the roof, or a corner of the rear garden wall. For that house was Clarence House, and the young man who posed so accommodatingly for the photographer was none other than Prince Arthur of Connaught, who was getting himself married the very next day. The next day I beheld from a short distance the passing of the bridal procession. There were crowds all along the route, followed by the wedding party. There was no scrounging, no shoving, no fighting, no disorderly scramble, no unseemly congestion about the chapel where the ceremony took place. It reminded me vividly of that which inevitably happens when a millionaire's daughter is being married to a duke in a fashionable Fifth Avenue church. It reminded me of that because it was so different. Fortunately for us we were so placed that we saw quite distinctly the entrance of the wedding party into the chapel enclosure. Personally I was most concerned with the members of the royal house. As I recollect, they passed in the following order. His Majesty, King George V. Her Majesty, Queen Mary, the other four-fifths. Small fractional royalties to the number of a dozen or more. I got a clear view of the side face of the Queen. As one looked on her profile, which was what you might call firm, and saw the mild-looking little king, who seemed quite eclipsed by her presence, one understood, or anyway one thought one understood, why an English assemblage, when standing to chant the national anthem these times, always puts such fervor and meaning into the first line of it. Only one untoward incident occurred. The inevitable militant lady broke through the lines as the imperial carriage passed and threw a votes for women handbill into His Majesty's lap. She was removed thence by the police with the skill and dexterity of long practice. The police were competently on the job. They always are, which brings me round to the subject of the London bobby and leads me to venture the assertion that individually and collectively, personally and officially, he is a splendid piece of work. The finest thing in London is the London policeman, and the worst thing is the shamefully small and shabby pay he gets. He is majestic because he represents the majesty of the English law. He is humble and obliging because, as a servant, he serves the people who make the law. And always he knows his business. In Charing Cross, where all roads meet and snarl up in the bewildering semblance of many fishing worms in a can, I ventured out into the roadway to ask a policeman the best route for reaching a place in a somewhat obscure quarter. He threw up his arm, semaphore fashion, first to this point of the compass and then to that, and traffic halted instantly. As far as the eye might reach it halted, and it stayed halted too, 
while he searched his mind and gave me carefully and painstakingly the directions for which I sought. In that packed mob of cabs and taxis and buses and carriages there were probably dukes and archbishops. Dukes and archbishops are always fussing about in London, but they waited until he was through directing me. It flattered me so that I went back to the hotel and put on a larger hat. I sincerely hoped there was at least one archbishop. Another time we went to Paddington to take a train for somewhere. Following the custom of the country, we took along our trunks and traps on the top of the taxicab. At the moment of our arrival there were no porters handy, so a policeman on post outside the station jumped forward on the instant and helped our chauffeur to wrestle the luggage down on the bricks. When I, rallying somewhat from the shock of this, thanked him and slipped a coin into his palm, he said in effect that, though he was obliged for the shilling, I must not feel that I had to give him anything, that it was part of his duty to aid the public in these small matters. I shut my eyes and tried to imagine a New York policeman doing as much for an unknown alien, but the effort gave me a severe headache. It gave me darting pains across the top of the skull, at about the spot where he would probably have belted me with his club had I even dared to ask him to bear a hand with my luggage. I had a peep into the workings of the system of which the London Bobby is a spoke when I went to what is the very hub of the wheel of the common law, a police court. I understood then what gave the policeman in the street his authority and his dignity, and his humility, when I saw how carefully the magistrate on the bench weighed each trifling cause and each petty case, how surely he winnowed out the small grain of truth from the gross and tear and surmise and fiction, how particular he was to give of the abundant store of his patience to any whining rag-picker or street-beggar who faced him, whether as defendant at the bar or accuser or witness. It was the very body of the law, though, we saw a few days after this, when, by invitation, we witnessed the procession at the opening of the high courts. Considered from the standpoints of picturesqueness and impressiveness, it made one's pulses tingle when those thirty or forty men of the Whig and Ermine marched in single and double file down the loftily vaulted hall, with the Lord Chancellor in Whig and robes of state leading, and Sir Rufus Isaacs, knee-breeched and sword-belted, a pace or two behind him, and then in turn the justices, and, going on ahead of them and following on behind them, night escorts and ushers and clerks and all the other human cogs of the great machine. What struck into me the deepest, however, was the look of nearly every one of the judges. Had they been dressed as longshoremen, one would still have known them for possessors of the judicial temperament, men born to hold the balances and fitted and trained to winnow out the wheat from the chaff. So many eagle-beaked noses, so many hot keen eyes, so many smooth-chopped, long-jowled faces, seen here together, made me think of what we are prone to regard as the high-water period of American statesmanship, the Clay, Calhoun, Benton, Webster period. End of section 35《Revised》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Europe Revised by Irvin S. Cobb. Chapter 17. Britain in 20 Minutes, Part 2. Just watching these men pass helped me to know better than any reading I had ever done why the English have faith and confidence in their courts. I said to myself that if I wanted justice, exact justice, heaping high in time-scales, I should come to this shop and give my trade to the old established firm. But if I were looking for a little mercy, I should take my custom elsewhere. I cannot tell why I associated in my mind with this grouped spectacle of the lords of the law, but somehow the scene to be witnessed in Hyde Park just inside the marble arch of a Sunday evening seems bound up somehow with the other institution. They call this place London's safety valve. It's all of that, Long ago the ruling powers discovered that if the rabidly discontented were permitted to preach dynamite and destruction, unlimited, they would not be so apt to practice their cheerful doctrines. So without letter hindrance, any apostle of any creed, cult, or propaganda, however lurid and revolutionary, may come here of a Sunday to meet with his disciples and spout forth the faith that is in him until he has geysered himself into peace, or, what comes to the same thing, into speechlessness." When I went to Hyde Park on a certain Sunday, rain was falling, and the crowds were not so large as usual. A bored policeman on duty in this outdoor forum told me, still, 
At that, there must have been two or three thousand listeners in sight, and not less than twelve speakers. These latter balanced themselves on small, portable platforms placed in rows, which such short spaces between them that their voices intermingled confusingly. In front of each orator stood his audience. Sometimes they applauded what he said in a sluggish British way, and sometimes they asked him questions designed to baffle or perplex him. Heckling, I believe this is called, but there was never any suggestion of disorder, and never any violent demonstration for or against a statement made by him. At the end of the line nearest the arch, under a flary light, stood an old bearded man having the look on his face of a kindly but somewhat irritated moo-cow. At the moment I drew near, he was having a long and involved argument with another controversialist, touching on the sense of the word tabernacle as employed scripturally, one holding it to mean the fleshly tenement of the soul, and the other an actual place of worship. The old man had two favorite words, behoove and emit, but behoove was evidently his choice. As an emitter he was only fair, but he was the best behoover I ever saw anywhere. The orator next to him was speaking in a soft, sentimental tone, with gestures gently appropriate. I moved along to him, being minded to learn what particular brand of brotherly love he might be expounding. In the same tone a good friend might employ in telling you what to do for chapped lips or a fever blister, he was saying that clergymen and armaments were useless and expensive burdens on the commonwealth and as a remedy he was advocating that all the priests and all the preachers in the kingdom should be loaded on the dreadnoughts, and then the dreadnoughts should be steamed to the deepest part of the Atlantic Ocean, and there cosily scuttled with all aboard. There was a scattering applause and a voice. Now, don't do that. Listen here. I've got a better plan. But the next speaker was blaring away at the top of his voice, making threatening faces and waving his clenched fists aloft, and pounding them with the top of his rostrum. Now this, I said to myself, is going to be something worth while. Surely this person would not be content merely with drowning all the parsons and sinking all the warships in the hole at the bottom of the sea. Undoubtedly he will advocate something really radical. I will invest five minutes with him. I did, but I was sold. He was favoring the immediate adoption of a universal tongue for all the peoples of the earth. That was all. I did not catch the name of his universal language but I judged the one at which he would excel would be a language with few, if any, H's in it. After this disappointment I lost heart and came away. Another phase, though a very different one, of the British spirit of fair play and tolerance, was shown to me at the National Sporting Club, which is the British shrine of boxing, where I saw a fight for one of the championship belts that Lord Lonsdale is forever bestowing on this or that worshipful fisticuffer. Instead of being inside the ring, prying the fingers apart by main force as he would have been doing in America, the referee, dressed in evening clothes, was outside the ropes. At a snapped word from him, the fighters broke apart from the clinches on the instant. The audience, a very mixed one, ranging in garb from broadcloths to shoddies, was as quick to approve a telling blow by the less popular fighter as to hiss any suggestion of trickiness or fouling on the part of the favorite. When a contestant in one of the preliminary goes, having been adjudged a loser on points, objected to the decision and insisted on being heard in his own behalf, the crowd, though plainly not in sympathy with his contention, listened to what he had to say. Nobody jeered him down. Had he been a foreigner, and especially had he been an American, I am inclined to think the situation might have been different. I seem to recall what happened once when a certain middleweight from this side went over there and broke the British heart by licking the British champion, and again what happened when a Yankee boy won the marathon at the Olympic Games in London a few years ago. But as this man was a Briton himself, these other Britons hearkened to his sputterings. For England, you know, grants the right of free speech to all Englishmen, and denies it to all English women. The settled Englishman declines always to be jostled out of his hereditary state of intense calm. They tell of a man who dashed into the reading-room of the Savage Club with the announcement that a lion was loose on the strand, a lion that had escaped from a travelling caravan and was rushing madly to and fro, scaring horses and frightening pedestrians. "'Great excitement! Most terrific, old dears, on my word!' he added, addressing the company. Over the top of the pink un, an elderly gentleman of a full habit of life regarded him sourly. 
"'Is that any reason,' he inquired, "'why a person should rush into a gentleman's club "'and kick up such a deuced hullabaloo?' "'The first man, he must have been a colonial, "'gazed at the other man in amazement. "'Well,' he asked, "'what would you do if you met a savage lion loose on the strand?' "'Sir, I should take a cab.' "'And after meeting an Englishman or two of this type, "'I am quite prepared to say the story might have been a true one. "'If he met a lion on the strand to-day, he would take a cab. "'But if to-morrow, walking in the same place, he met two lions, "'he would write a letter to the Times, "'complaining of the growing prevalence of lions in the public thoroughfares, "'and placing the blame on the suffragettes, or Lloyd George, "'or the nonconformists, or the increasing discontent of the working classes. "'That is what he would do.' On the other hand, if he met a squirrel on a street in America, it would be a most extraordinary thing. Extraordinary would undoubtedly be the word he would use to describe it. Lions on the Strand would be merely annoying, but chipmunks on Broadway would constitute a striking manifestation of the unsettled conditions existing in a wild and misgoverned land. For, you see, to every right-minded Englishman of the insular variety, and that is the commonest variety there is in England, Whatever happens at home is but part of an orderly and ordered scheme of things, whereas whatever happens beyond the British domains must necessarily be highly unusual and exceedingly disorganizing. If so be it happens on English soil, he can excuse it. He always has an explanation or an extenuation handy. But if it happens elsewhere, well, there you are, you see. What was it somebody once called England? Perfidious alibian, wasn't it? Anyhow, that's what he meant. The party's intentions were good, but his spelling was faulty. An Englishman's newspapers help him to attain this frame of mind, for an English newspaper does not print sensational stories about Englishmen residing in England, it prints them about people resident in other lands. There is a good reason for this, and the reason is based on prudence. In the first place, the private life of a private individual is a most holy thing, with which the papers dare not meddle. Besides, the paper that printed a faked-up tale about a private citizen in England would speedily be exposed, and so extensively sued. As for public men, they are protected by exceedingly stringent libel laws. As nearly as I might judge, anything true you printed about an English politician would be libelous, and anything libelous you printed about him would be true. End of section 36《of Europe Revised》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《Europe Revised》by Irvin S. Cobb Chapter 17 Britain in Twenty Minutes, Part 3 It befalls, therefore, as I was told on most excellent authority, that when the editor of a live London daily finds the local grist to be dull and uninteresting reading, he straightway cables to his American correspondent or his Paris correspondent, these two being his main standbys for sensations, asking if his choice falls on the man in America for a snappy dispatch, say, about an American train smash-up, or a nature freak, or a scandal in high society with a rich man mixed up in it. He wires for it, and in reply he gets it. I have been in my time a country correspondent for city papers, and I know that what Mr. Editor wants, Mr. Editor gets. As a result, America, to the provincial Englishman's understanding, is a land where a hunter is always being nibbled to death by sheep, or a prospective mother is being so badly frightened by a chameleon that her child is born with a complexion changeable at will, and an ungovernable appetite for flies, or a billionaire is giving a monkey dinner or poisoning his wife or something. Also, he gets the idea that a through train in this country is so called because it invariably runs through the train ahead of it, and that when a man in Connecticut is expecting a friend on the fast express from Boston, and wants something to remember him by, he goes down to the station at train time with a bucket. Under the headlining system of the English newspapers, the derailment of a work train in Arizona, wherein several Mexican track layers get mussed up, becomes another frightful American railway disaster but a head-on collision, attended by fatalities, in the suburbs of Liverpool or Manchester, is a distressing suburban incident. Yet the official blue book, issued by the British Board of Trade, showed that in the three months ending March 31, 1913, 284 persons were killed, and 2,457 were injured on railway lines in the United Kingdom. 
Just as an English gentleman is the most modest person imaginable, and the most backward about offering lift service in praise of his own achievements or his country's achievements, so, in the same superlative degree, some of his newspapers are the most blatant of boasters. About the time we were leaving England, the job of remodeling and beautifying the front elevation of Buckingham Palace reached its conclusion, and a dinner was given to the working men who, for some months, had been engaged on the contract. It had been expected that the occasion would be graced by the presence of their majesties, but the king, as I recall, was pasting stamps in the new album the Tsar of Russia sent him on his birthday, and the queen was looking through the files of Godey's Ladies' Book for the year 1874, picking out suitable costumes for the ladies of her court to wear. At any rate, they could not attend. Otherwise, though, the dinner must have been a success. Reading the account of it as published next morning in a London newspaper, I learned that some of the guests, with rare British pluck, wore their caps and corduroys, that others, with true British independence, smoked their pipes after dinner, that there was real British beef and genuine British plum pudding on the menu, and that repeatedly those present uttered hearty British cheers. From top to bottom the column was studded thick with British thises and British thats. Yet the editorial writers of that very paper are given to frequent and sneering attacks on the alleged yellowness and the boasting proclivities of the jingo Yankee sheets. Also they are prone to spasmodic attacks on the laxity of our marriage laws. Perhaps what they say of us is true, but for unadulterated nastiness I never saw anything in print to equal the front page of a so-called sporting weekly that circulates freely in London, and I know of nothing to compare with the brazen exhibition of a certain form of vice that is to be witnessed nightly in the balconies of two of London's largest music halls. It was upon the program of another London theatre that I came across the advertisement of a lady styling herself London's Woman Detective, and stating, in so many words, that her specialties were divorce shadowings and secret inquiries. Maybe it is a fact that in certain of our states marriage is not so much a contract as a ninety-day option, but the lady detective who does divorce shadowings and advertises her qualifications publicly has not opened up her shop among us. In the campaign to give the stay-at-home Englishman a strange conception of his American kinsman, the press is ably assisted by the stage. In London I went to see a comedy written by a deservedly successful dramatist, and staged, I think, under his personal direction. The English characters in the play were whimsical, and, as nearly as I might judge, true to the classes they purported to represent. There was an American character in this piece, too, a multimillionaire, of course, and a collector of pictures, presumably a dramatically fair and realistic drawing of a wealthy, successful, art-loving American. I have forgotten now whether he was supposed to be one of our meaty Chicago millionaires, or one of our oily Cleveland millionaires, or one of our steely Pittsburgh millionaires, or just a plain millionaire from the country at large, and I doubt whether the man who wrote the lines had any conception when he did write them of the fashion in which they were afterward read. Be that as it may, the actor who essayed to play the American used an inflection, or an accent, or a dialect, or a jargon, or whatever you might choose to call it, which was partly of the old-time drawly wild western school of expression, and partly of the old-time nasal down-east school. I had thought, and had hoped, that both these actor-created lingos were happily obsolete, but in their full flower of perfection I now heard them here in London. Also, the actor who played the part interpreted the physical angles of the character in a manner suggest a pleasing combination of Uncle Joshua Whitcomb, Mike the Bite, Jefferson Brick and Coal Oil Johnny, with the suggestion of Jesse James interspersed here and there. True, he spat not on the carpet loudly, and he refrained from saying, I vum, and great snakes. Quaint conceits that, I am told, every English actor who respected his art formally employed, when wishful to type a stage American for an English audience. But he bragged loudly and emphatically of his money, and how he got it, and of what he would do with it. I do not perceive why it is the English, who themselves so dearly love the dollar after it is translated into terms of pounds, shillings, and pence, should insist on regarding us as a nation of dollar-grabbers, when they only see us in the act of freely dispensing the aforesaid dollar. They do so regard us, though, and with true British setness I suppose they always will. Even so, I think that, though they may dislike us as a nation, they like us as individuals 
and it is certainly true that they seem to value us more highly than they value colonials, as they call them, particularly Canadian colonials. It would appear that your true Briton can never excuse another British subject for the shockingly poor taste he displayed in being born away from home. And, though in time he may forgive us for refusing to be licked by him, he can never forgive the colonials for saving him from being licked in South Africa. When I started in to write this chapter, I meant to conclude it with an apology for my audacity in undertaking, in any wise, to sum up the local characteristics of a country where I had tarried for so short a time, but I have changed my mind about that. I have merely borrowed a page from the book of rules of the British essayists and novelists who come over here to write us up. Why, bless your soul, I gave nearly eight weeks of time to the task of seeing Europe thoroughly, and of those eight weeks I spent upwards of three weeks in and about London. Indeed, a most unreasonably long time, when measured by the standards of the Englishman of letters who does a book about us. He has his itinerary mapped out in advance. He will squander a whole week on us. We are scarcely worth it, but, such as we are, we shall have a week of his company. Landing on Monday morning, he will spend Monday in New York, Tuesday in San Francisco, and Wednesday in New Orleans. Thursday he will divide between Boston and Chicago, devoting the forenoon to one and the afternoon to the other. Friday morning he will range through the Rocky Mountains, and after luncheon, if he is not too fatigued, he will take a carriage and pop in on Yosemite Valley for an hour or so. But Saturday, all of it, will be given over to the fair Southland. He is going way down south, to sunny South Dakota, in fact, to see the genuine Native American darkies, the real Yankee blackamoors. Most interesting beings, the blackamoors. They live exclusively on poultry fowls, you know, and all their women folk are named Honey Gal. He will observe them in their hours of leisure, when, attired in their national costume, consisting of white duck breeches, banjos, and striped shirts with high collars, they gather beneath the rays of the silvery southern moon to sing their tribal melodies on the melon-lined shores of the old Oswego, and by day he will study them at their customary employment as they climb from limb to limb of the cottonwood trees, picking cotton. On Sunday he will arrange and revise his notes, and on Monday morning he will sail for home. Such is the program of Solomon Grundy, Esquire, the distinguished writing Englishman, but on his arrival he finds the country to be somewhat larger than he expected, larger, actually, than the Midlands. So he compromises by spending five days at a private hotel in New York, run by a very worthy and deserving Englishwoman of the middle classes, where one may get Yorkshire puddings every day, and two more days at a wealthy tuft-hunter's million-dollar cottage at Newport, studying the habits and idiosyncrasies of the common people. And then he rushes back to England, and hurriedly embalms his impressions of us in a large volume, stating it to be his deliberate opinion that, though we really mean well enough, we won't do, really. He necessarily has to hurry, because, you see, he has a contract to write a novel or play, or both a novel and a play, with Lord Northcliffe as the central figure. In these days, practically all English novels and most English comedies play up Lord Northcliffe as the central figure. Almost invariably the young English writer chooses him for the axis about which his plot shall resolve. English journalists who have been discharged from one of Northcliffe's publications make him their villain, and English journalists who hope to secure jobs on one of his publications make him their hero. The literature of a land is in perilous case when it depends on the personality of one man. One shudders to think what the future of English fiction would be should anything happen to his lordship. Business of shuddering! End of section 37of Europe Revised. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Europe Revised by Irvin S. Cobb. Chapter 18. Guide or Guided. Part 1. During our scientific explorations in the Eastern Hemisphere, we met two guides who had served the late Samuel L. Clemens, one who had served the late J. Pierpont Morgan, and one who had acted as courier to ex-President Theodore Roosevelt. After inquiry among persons who were also lately abroad, I have come to the conclusion that my experience in this regard was remarkable, not because I met so many as four of the guides who had attended these distinguished Americans, but because I met so few as four of them. 
One man with whom I discussed the matter told of having encountered, in the course of a brief scurry across Europe, five members in good standing of the International Association of Former Guides to Mark Twain. All of them had union cards to prove it, too. Others said that in practically every city of any size visited by them, there was a guide who told of his deep attachment to the memory of Mr. Morgan, and described how Mr. Morgan had hired him without inquiring in advance what his rate for professional services a day would be, and how, lingering with wistful emphasis on the words along here and looking meaningly all the while at the present patron, how very, very generous Mr. Morgan had been in bestowing gratuities on parting. Our first experience with guides was at Westminster Abbey. As it happened, this guide was one of the Mark Twain survivors. I think, though, he was genuine. He had documents of apparent authenticity in his possession to help him in proving up his title. Anyhow, he knew his trade. He led us up and down those parts of the abbey which are free to the general public, and brought us finally to a wicket-gate, opening on the royal chapels, which was as far as he could go. There he turned us over to a severe-looking dignitary in robes, an archbishop, I judged, or possibly only a canon, who, on payment by us of a shilling a head, escorted our party through the remaining enclosures, showing us the tombs of England's queens and kings, or a good many of them anyway, and the black prince's helmet and breastplate, and the exquisite chapel of Henry the Seventh, and the ancient chair on which all the kings sat for their coronations, with the famous Scotch stone of scone under it. The chair itself was not particularly impressive. It was not nearly so rickety and decrepit as the chairs one sees in almost any London barber shop. Nor was my emotion particularly excited by the stone. I would engage to get a better looking one out of the handiest rock quarry inside of twenty minutes. This stone should not be confused with the ordinary scones, which also come from Scotland, and which are by some regarded as edible. What did seem to us a rather queer thing was that the authorities of Westminster should make capital of the dead rulers of the realm, and, except on certain days of the week, should charge an admission fee to their sepulchres. Later, on the continent, we sustained an even more severe shock, when we saw royal palaces, palaces that on occasion are used by the royal proprietors, with the quarters of the monarchs upstairs and downstairs novelty shops and tourist agencies and restaurants, and the like of that. I jotted down a few crisp notes concerning these matters, my intention being to comment on them as evidence of an incomprehensible thrift on the part of our European kinspeople, but on second thought I decided to refrain from so doing. I recalled the fact that we ourselves are not entirely free from certain petty national economies. Abroad we house our embassies up back streets, next door to bird and animal stores, and at home there is many a public institution where the doormat says welcome in large letters, but the soap is chained and the roller towel is padlocked to its little roller. Guides are not particularly numerous in England. Even in the places most frequented by the sightseer they do not abound in any profusion. At Madame Tussaud's, for example, we found only one guide. We encountered him just after we had spent a mournful five minutes in contemplation of ex-President Taft. Friends and acquaintances of Mr. Taft will be shocked to note the great change in him when they see him here in wax. He does not weigh so much as he used to weigh by at least one hundred and fifty pounds. He has lost considerable height, too. His hair has turned another color, and his eyes also. His mustache is not a close fit any more, either and he is wearing a suit of English-made clothes. On leaving the sadly altered form of our former chief executive, we descended a flight of stone steps leading to the Chamber of Horrors. This department was quite crowded with parents escorting their children about. Like America, England appears to be well stocked with parents who make a custom of taking their young and susceptible offspring to places where the young ones stand a good chance of being scared into conniption fits. The official guide was in the chamber of horrors. He was piloting a large group of visitors about, but as soon as he saw our smaller party he left them and came directly to us, for they were Scotch and we were Americans, citizens of the happy land where tips come from. Undoubtedly that guide knew best. With pride and pleasure he showed us a representative assortment of England's most popular and prominent murderers. The English dearly love a murderer. Perhaps that is because they have fewer murderers than we have, and have less luck than we do in keeping them alive and in good spirits to a ripe old age. Almost any American community of fair size can afford at least two murderers, 
one in jail under sentence, receiving gifts of flowers and angel cake from kind ladies, and waiting for the court above to reverse the verdict in his case because the indictment was shy a comma, and the other out on bail, awaiting his time for going through the same procedure. But with the English it is different. We rarely hang anybody who is anybody, and only occasionally make an issue of stretching the neck of the various nobody. They will hang almost nobody ham and high, or even higher than that. They do not exactly hang their murderer before they catch him, but the two events occur in such close succession that one can readily understand why a confusion should have arisen in the public mind on these points. First of all, though, they catch him, and then, some morning between ten and twelve, they try him. This is a brief and business-like formality. While the judge is looking in a drawer of his desk to see whether the black cap is handy, the bailiffs shoe twelve tradesmen to the jury box. A tradesman is generally chosen for jury service because he is naturally anxious to get the thing over and hurry back to his shop before his helper goes to lunch. The judge tells the jurors to look on the prisoner, because he is going away shortly and is not expected back. So they take full advantage of the opportunity, realizing it to be their last chance. Then, in order to comply with the forms, the judge asks the accused whether he is guilty or not guilty, and the jurors promptly say he is. His worship, concurring heartily, fixes the date of execution for the first Friday morning when the hangman has no other engagements. It is never necessary to postpone this event, through failure of the condemned to be present. He is always there. There is no record of his having disappointed an audience. So on the date named, rain or shine, he is hanged very thoroughly, but after the hanging is over they write songs and books about him and revere his memory forevermore. Our guide was pleased to introduce us to the late Mr. Charles Pease, as done in paraffin, with creped hair and bright shiny glass eyes. Mr. Pease was undoubtedly England's most fashionable murderer of the past century, and his name is imperishably enshrined in the British affections. The guide spoke of his life and works with deep and sincere feeling. He also appeared to derive unfeigned pleasure from describing the accomplishments of another murderer, only slightly less famous than the late Mr. Pease. It seemed that this murderer, after slaying his victim, set to dismembering the body and boiling it. They boil nearly everything in England, but the police broke in on him and interrupted the job. Our attention was directed to a large chart showing the form of the victim, the boiled portions being outlined in red, and the unboiled portions in black. Considered as a murderer solely, this particular murderer may have been deserving of his fame, but when it came to boiling that was another matter. He showed poor judgment there. It all goes to show that a man should stick to his own trade, and not try to follow two or more widely dissimilar callings at the same time. Sooner or later he is bound to slip up. We found Stratford-upon-Avon to be the one town in England where guides are really abundant. There are as many guides in Stratford as there are historic spots. I started to say that there is at least one guide in Stratford for every American who goes there, but that would be stretching real facts, because nearly every American who goes to England manages to spend at least a day in Stratford, it being a spot very dear to his heart. The very name of it is associated with two of the most conspicuous figures in our literature. I refer first to Andrew Carnegie, second to William Shakespeare. Shakespeare, who wrote the books, was born here, but Carnegie, who built the libraries in which to keep the books, and who has done some writing himself, provided the money for preserving and perpetuating the relics. We met a guide in the ancient schoolhouse where the bard, I am now speaking of William, not of Andrew, acquired the rudiments of his education, and on duty at the old village church was another guide, who for a price showed us the identical gravestone bearing the identical inscription which, reproduced in a design of burnt wood, is to-day to be found on the walls of every American household, however humble, whose members are wishful of imparting an artistic and literary atmosphere to their home. A third guide greeted us warmly when we drove to the cottage, a mile or two from the town, where the Hathaway family lived. Here we saw the high-backed settee on which Shakespeare sat, night after night, wooing Anne Hathaway. I myself sat on it to test it. I should say that the wooing could not have been particularly good there, especially for a thin man. That settee had a very hard seat, and history does not record that there was a cushion. Shakespeare's affections for the lady must indeed have been steadfast, or perhaps he was of stouter build than his pictures show him to have been. 
Guides were scattered all over the birthplace house in Stratford in the ratio of one or more to each room. Downstairs a woman guide presided over a battery of glass cases containing personal belongings of Shakespeare's and documents written by him and signed by him. It is conceded that he could write, but he certainly was a mighty poor speller. This has been a failing of many well-known writers. Chaucer was deficient in this regard, and if it were not for a feeling of personal modesty I could apply the illustration nearer home. Two guides accompanied us as we climbed the stairs to the low-roofed room on the second floor, where the creator of Shylock and Juliet was born, or was not born, if you believe what Ignatius Donnelly had to say on the subject. But would it not be interesting and valued information if we could only get the evidence on this point of old Mrs. Shakespeare, who undoubtedly was present on the occasion? A member of our party, an American, ventured to remark as much to one of the guides, but the latter did not seem to understand him. So the American told him just to keep thinking it over at odd moments, and that he would be back again in a couple of years, if nothing happened, and possibly by that time the guide would have caught the drift of his observation. On second thought, later on, he decided to make it three years. He did not want to crowd the guide, he said, or put too great a burden on his mentality in a limited space of time. End of section 38「Section 39 of Europe Revised」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Europe Revised by Irvin S. Cobb Chapter 18 Guide or Guided Part 2 If England harbors few guides, the continent is fairly glutted with them. After nightfall the boulevards of Paris are so choked with them that in places there is standing room only. In Rome the congestion is even greater. In Rome every other person is a guide, and sometimes twins. I don't know why, in thinking of Europe, I invariably associate the subject of guides with the subject of tips. The guides were no greedier for tips than the cabmen, or the hotel helpers, or the railroad hands, or the populace at large. Nevertheless this is true. In my mind I am sure guides and tips will always be coupled, as surely as any of those standard team-word combinations of our language that are familiar to us all as firmly paired off as, for example, Castor and Pollux, or Damon and Pythias, or Fair and Warmer, or Hay and Feed. When I think of one, I know I shall think of the other. Also, I shall think of languages, but for that there is a reason. Tipping, the giving of tips and the occasional avoidance of giving them, takes up a good deal of the tourist time in Europe. At first reading the arrangement devised by the guidebooks, of setting aside ten per cent of one's bill for tipping purposes, seems a better plan and a less costly one than the indiscriminate american system of tipping for each small service at the time of its performance the trouble is that this arrangement does not work out so well in actual practice as it sounds in theory on the day of your departure you send for your hotel bill you do not go to the desk and settle up there after the american fashion if you have learned the ropes you order your room waiter to fetch your bill to you and in the privacy of your apartment you pour over the formidable document, wherein every small charge is fully specified, and the whole concluding with an impressive array of items regarding which you have no prior recollection whatsoever. Considering the total, you put aside an additional ten per cent, calculated for division on the basis of so much for the waiter, so much for the boots, so much for the maid and the porter, and the cashier, and the rest of them. It is not necessary that you send for these persons in order to confer your farewell remembrances on them. They will be waiting for you in the hallways. No matter how early or how late the hour of your leaving may be, you find them there in a long and serried rank. You distribute bills and coins until your ten per cent is exhausted, and then you are pained to note that several servitors yet remain, lined up and all expectant, owners of strange faces that you do not recall ever having seen before, but who are now at hand with claims, real or imaginary, on your purse. Inasmuch as you have a deadly fear of being remembered afterward in this hotel as a piker, you continue to dip down and fork over, and so by the time you reach the tail end of the procession your ten per cent has grown to twelve or fifteen per cent, or even more. 
As regards the tipping of guides for their services, I hit on a fairly satisfactory plan, which I gladly reveal here for the benefit of my fellow man. I think it is a good idea to give the guide, on parting, about twice as much as you think he is entitled to, which will be about half as much as he expects. From this starting point you then work toward each other, you conceding a little from time to time, he abating a trifle here and there, until you have reached a happy compromise on the basis of fifty-fifty, and so you part in mutual good will. The average American, on the eve of going to Europe, thinks of the European as speaking each his own language. He conceives of the Poles speaking Polar, of the Hollanders talking Hollandaise, of the Swiss employing Schweitzer for ordinary conversations, and yodeling when addressing friends at a distance, and so on. Such, however, is rarely the case. Nearly every person with whom one comes in contact in Europe appears to have fluent command of several tongues besides his or her own. It is true this does not apply to Italy, where the natives mainly stick to Italian, but then Italian is not a language, it is a calisthenic. Between Rome and Florence our train stopped at a small way station in the mountains. As soon as the little locomotive had panted itself to a standstill, the train hands, following their habit, piled off the cars and engaged in a tremendous confab with the assembled officials on the platform. Immediately all the loafers in sight drew cards. A drowsy hillsman, muffled to his back hair in a long brown cloak, and with buskins on his legs such as a stage bandit wears, was dozing against the wall. He looked as though he had stepped right out of a comic opera to add picturesqueness to the scene. He roused himself and joined in, so did a bearded party who, to judge by his uniform, was either a knight of Pythias or a general in the army, so did the rest of the crowd. In ten seconds they were jammed together in a hard knot, and going in on the high speed with the muffler off, fine white teeth showing, arms flying, shoulders shrugging, spinal columns writhing, mustaches rising and falling, legs wriggling, scalps and ears following suit. Feeding hour in the parrot cage at the zoo never produced anything like so noisy and animated a scene. In these parts acute hysteria is not a symptom, it is merely a state of mind. A waiter in soiled habiliments hurried up, abandoning chances of trade at the prospect of something infinitely more exciting. He wanted to stick his oar into the argument. He had a few pregnant thoughts of his own craving utterance, you could tell that but he was handicapped into a state of dumbness by the fact that he needed both arms to balance a tray of wine, and sandwiches, on his head. Merely using his voice in that company would not have counted. He stood it as long as he could, which was not very long, let me tell you. Then he slammed his tray down on the platform, and, with one quick movement, jerked his coat sleeves back to his elbows, and inside thirty seconds he had the floor in both hands, as it were. He conversed mainly with the Australian crawl stroke, but once in a while switched to the Spencerian free arm movement, and occasionally introduced the Chautauqua salute, with telling effect. On the continent, guides, as a class, excel in the gift of tongues, guides and hotel concierges. The concierge at our hotel in Berlin was a big, upstanding chap, half Russian and half Swiss, and therefore qualified by his breeding to speak many languages for the Russians are born with split tongues and can give cards and spades to any talking crow that ever lived, while the Swiss lag but a little behind them in linguistic aptitude. It seemed such a pity that this man was not alive when the hands knocked off work on the Tower of Babel. He could have put the job through without extending himself. No matter what the nationality of a guest might be, and the guests were of many nationalities, he could talk with that guest in his own language or in any other language the guest might fancy. I myself was sorely tempted to try him on Coptic and early Aztec, but I held off. My Coptic is not what it once was, and partly through disuse and partly through carelessness, I have allowed my command of early Aztec to fall off pretty badly these last few months. All linguistic freakishness is not confined to the continent. The English, who are popularly supposed to use the same language we ourselves use, sometimes speak with a mighty strange tongue. A great many of them do not speak English, they speak British, a very different thing. An Englishwoman of breeding has a wonderful speaking voice, as pure as a Boston woman's and more liquid, as soft as a Southern woman's and with more attention paid to the R's. But the Cockney type, wow-wee! During a carriage ride in Florence with a mixed company of tourists, 
I chanced to say something of a complimentary nature about something English, and a little London-bred woman spoke up and said, "'Thanks. It's very nice of you to say so, I'm sure.' Some of them talk like that. Honestly, they do. Though Americo-English may not be an especially musical speech, it certainly does lend itself most admirably to slang purposes. Here again the Britishers show their inability to utilize the vehicle to the full of its possibilities. England never produced a Billy Baxter or a George Ade, and I am afraid she never will. Most of our slang means something. You hear a new slang phrase, and instantly you realize that the genius who coined it has hit on a happy, and a graphic, and an illuminating expression, that at one bound he rose triumphant above the limitations of language, and tremendously enriched the working vocabulary of the man in the street. Whereas an Englishman's idea of slinging slang is to scoop up, at random, some inoffensive and well-meaning word that never did him any harm, and apply it in the place of some other word, to which the first word is not related, not even by marriage. And look how deliberately they mispronounce proper names. Everybody knows about Chalmodely and St. John. But take the Scandinavian word fjord. Why, I ask you, should the English insist on pronouncing it Ferguson? At Oxford, the seat of learning, Magdalen is pronounced Maudlin, probably in subtle tribute to the condition of the person who first pronounced it so. General admission day is not the day you enter, but the day you leave. Full term means three-quarters of a term. An ordinary degree is a degree obtained by special examination. An inspector of arts does not mean an inspector of arts, but a student, and from this point they go right ahead, getting worse all the time. The droll creature who compiled the Oxford glossary was a true Englishman. When an Englishman undertakes to wrestle with American slang, he makes a fearful hash of it. In an English magazine I read a short story, written by an Englishman who is regarded by a good many persons, competent to judge, as being the cleverest writer of English alive today. The story was beautifully done from the standpoint of composition. It bristled with flashing metaphors and whimsical phrasing. The scene of the yarn was supposed to be Chicago, and naturally the principal figure in it was a millionaire. In one place the author has this person saying, I reckon y'all feel pretty mean, and in another place, I reckon I'm not a man with no pull. Another character in the story says, I know you don't cotton to the march of science in these matters, and speaks of something that is unusual as being a rum affair. A walled state prison, presumably in Illinois, is referred to as a convict camp, and its warden is called a governor, and an assistant keeper is called a warder, while a Chicago daily paper is quoted as saying that Larrikins directed the attention of a policeman to a person who was doing thus and so. The writer describes a mysterious mirror known as Pilgrim's Pond, in which they say, a prison official is supposed to be talking now, our fathers made witches walk until they sank. Descendants of the original Puritans who went from Plymouth Rock in the summer of 1621 and founded Chicago will recall this pond distinctly. Cotton Mather is buried on its far bank, and from there it is just ten minutes by trolley to Salem, Massachusetts. It is stated also in this story that the prairies begin a matter of thirty-odd miles from Chicago, and that to reach them one must first traverse a perfect no-man's land. Inglewood and South Chicago papers please copy. End of section 39. Lyric Revised. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Europe Revised by Irvin S. Cobb. Chapter 19. Venice and the Venisons. Part 1. Getting back again to guides, I am reminded that our acquaintanceship with the second member of the Mark Twain Brotherhood was staged in Paris. This gentleman wished himself on us one afternoon at the Hotel des Invalides. We did not engage him, he engaged us, doing the trick with such finesse and skill that before we realized it we had been retained to accompany him to various points of interest in and around Paris. However, we remained under his control one day only. At nightfall we rested ourselves free, and fled under cover of darkness to German soil, where we were comparatively safe. I never knew a man who advanced so rapidly in a military way as he did during the course of that one day. Our own National Guard could not hold a candle to him. 
He started out at 10 a.m. by being an officer of volunteers in the Franco-Prussian War. But every time he slipped away and took a nip out of his private bottle, which was often, he advanced in rank automatically. Before the dusk of evening came he was a corps commander, who had been ennobled on the field of battle by the hand of Napoleon III. He took us to Versailles. We did not particularly care to go to Versailles that day, because it was raining, but he insisted and we went. In spite of the drizzle we might have enjoyed that wonderful place had he not been constantly at our elbows, gabbling away steadily except when he excused himself for a moment and stepped behind a tree, to emerge a moment later wiping his mouth on his sleeve. Then he would return to us, with an added gimpiness in his elderly legs, an increased expansion of the chest inside his tight and shiny frock coat, and a fresh freight of richness on his breath to report another deserved promotion. After he had eaten luncheon, all except such portions of it as he spilled on himself, the colonel grew confidential and chummy. He tried to tell me an off-color story and forgot the point of it, if indeed it had any point. He began humming the Marseillaise hymn, but broke off to say he expected to live to see the day when a column of French troops, singing that air, would march up unter den London to stack their arms in the halls of the Kaiser's palace. I did not take issue with him. Every man is entitled to his own wishes in those matters. But later on, when I had seen something of the Kaiser's standing army, I thought to myself that when French troops did march up unter den Linden they would find it tolerably rough sledding and if there was any singing done, a good many of them probably would not be able to join in the last verse. Immediately following this, our conductor confided to me that he had once had the honor of serving Mr. Clemens, whom he referred to as Mick Twine. He told me things about Mr. Clemens of which I had never heard. I do not think Mr. Clemens ever heard of them either. Then the brigadier, it was now after three o'clock, and between three and three-thirty he was a brigadier, drew my arm within his. I, too, am an author, he stated. It is not generally known, but I have written much. I wrote a book of which you may have heard, The Wandering Jew. And then he tapped himself on the bosom proudly. I said I had somehow contracted a notion that a party named Sue, Eugene Sue, had something to do with writing the work of that name. Ah, but you are right there, my friend. Sue surely wrote The Wandering Jew the first time, as a novel merely but I wrote him much better, as a satire on the anti-Semitic movement. I surrendered without offering to strike another blow, and from that time on he had his own way with us. The day, as I was pleased to note at the time, had begun mercifully to draw to a close. We were driving back to Paris, and he, sitting on the front seat, had just attained the highest post in the army under the regime of the last empire, when he said, Behold, monsieur, we are now approaching a wine-shop on the left. You were most gracious and kind in the matter of luncheon. Kindly permit me to do the honors now. It is a very good wine-shop. I know it well. Shall we stop for a glass together, eh? It was the first time since we landed at Calais that a native-born person had offered to buy me anything, and being ever desirous to assist in the celebration of any truly notable occasion, I accepted and the car was stopped. We were at the portal of the wine-shop when he plucked at my sleeve, offering another suggestion. The chauffeur now, he is a worthy fellow, that chauffeur. Shall we not invite the chauffeur to join us? I was agreeable to that, too. So he called the chauffeur, and the chauffeur disentangled his whiskers from the steering gear and came and joined us. The chauffeur and I each had a small glass of light wine, but the general took brandy. Then ensued a spirited dialogue between him and the woman who kept the shop. Assuming that I had no interest in the matter, I studied the pictures behind the bar. Presently, having reduced the woman to a state of comparative silence, he approached me. Monsieur, he said, I regret that this has happened. Because you are a foreigner, and because you know not our language, that woman would make an overcharge, but she forgot she had me to deal with. I am on guard. See her. She is now quelled. I have given her a lesson she will not soon forget. Monsieur, the correct amount of the bill is two francs ten. Give it to her, and let us be gone." I still have that guide's name and address in my possession. At parting he pressed his card on me and asked me to keep it, and I did keep it. I shall be glad to loan it to any American who may be thinking of going to Paris. With the card in his pocket he will know exactly where this guide lives, and then, when he is in need of a guide, he can carefully go elsewhere and hire a guide. I almost failed to mention that before we parted he tried to induce us to buy something. 
he took us miles out of our way to a pottery and urged us to invest in its wares. This is the main purpose of every guide, to see that you buy something and afterward to collect his commission from the shopkeeper for having brought you to the shop. If you engage your guide through the porter at your hotel, you will find that he steers you to the shops the hotel people have already recommended to you. But if you break the boarder's heart by hiring your guide outside, independently, the guide steers you to the shops that are on his own private list. Only once I saw a guide temporarily stumped, and that was in Venice. The skies were leaky that day, and the weather was raw, and one of the ladies of the party wore pumps and silk stockings. For the protection of her ankles she decided to buy a pair of cloth gaiters, and stating her intention, she started to go into a shop that dealt in those articles. The guide hesitated a moment only, then threw himself in her path. The shops hereabout were not to be trusted. The proprietors, without exception, were rogues and extortioners. If Madame would have patience for a few brief moments, he would guarantee that she got what she wanted at an honest price. He seemed so desirous of protecting her that she consented to wait. In a minute, on a pretext, he excused himself and dived into one of the crooked ways that spread through all parts of Venice, and make it possible for one who knows their windings to reach any part of the city without using the canals. Two of us secretly followed him. Beyond the first turning he dived into a shoe shop. Emerging after a while, he hurried back and led the lady to that same shop, and stood by, smiling softly, while she was fitted with gaiters. Until now, evidently, gaiters had not been on his list, but he had taken steps to remedy this, and, though his commission on a pair of sixty-cent gaiters could not have been very large, yet, as some philosopher has so truly said, every little bit added to what you have makes just a modicum more. Indeed, the guide never overlooks the smallest bet. His whole mentality is focused on getting you inside a shop. Once you are there, he stations himself close behind you, reinforcing the combined importunities of the shopkeeper and his assembled staff with gentle suggestions. The depths of self-abasement to which a shopkeeper in Europe will descend in an effort to sell his goods surpasses the power of description. The London tradesman goes pretty far in this direction. Often he goes as far as the sidewalk, clinging to the hem of your garment and begging you to return for one more look. But the Continentals are still worse. End of section 40